Welcome to the Children in Scotland podcast. This is a special episode recorded at a meeting of our strategic forum in April 2020. The focus of the meeting was the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on children, families and the children's sector. The discussion focused on the role of the third sector during the crisis and aimed to generate ideas, actions and proposals for the weeks and months ahead. There are contributions from Scottish Government, as well as organisations across the sector, representing health, social work, education, early learning, play, childminding, child rights and youth work. The approach we've taken over the last couple of years is that we have aimed to highlight two or three key issues that we want and strategic issues that we want to pursue. Child poverty, children's rights and incorporation, uh, wider well-being and mental health issues and then how we embed the role of the children's sector in a range of planning approaches. So that's, that's great, that work will continue, but this forum is obviously a response to the pandemic and firstly an opportunity to just connect with you all. Certainly I'm missing you all and that, that sort of sense in which we're here on a shared endeavour um, in normal times, let alone now. So it's really, really great to, to, to reconnect. But critically, the forum has, a, has a, I think, a very important role and opportunity to be a conduit and to take, to take stock and be a conduit for how we can make sure that the needs of all our children, young people and families are as protected as possible, that they're getting the full support as much as possible. And of course, picking up on those children and families who might be most vulnerable. So I'm really delighted to to welcome Scottish Government um, attendees. So what I'm going to propose is that we ask the Scottish Government to um, just say a few words to, um, to, in a sense, to talk about the response that um, they've been involved in, that they're leading, and to bring us as up to date as possible about where they are now and their current priorities and a bit of a forward look about um, and by forward, I probably mean over the next few days, even about where they're, what they're looking to do um, in order to look at how um, various systems of supports are responding to children and families' needs. Then I want to um, open up in, in, and use the agenda and format that we sent out to forum members last week. I want to start with our impact on children. Um, and we've had several contributions from you. So I'll invite those who have already contributed before we open up a bit more widely. We're going to talk firstly, as I said, on impact on children for about 15 minutes, then impact on the workforce. And again, people have come back with certain issues. We'll take 10 to 15 minutes there. And then the role of the third sector. All of you, I'm sure, will understand. I think we treat this meeting as a, a generating of ideas and actions and proposals. So it's an agenda raising rather than getting too much into the detail because I don't expect this to be the last meeting of the forum. I expect that we'll be meeting more regularly. We can talk about that. But um, please, could you keep your contributions really to the point and brief, but obviously really keen to make sure that you've got as much opportunity to hear the range of views as possible. So if that's okay, perhaps I could invite Scottish Government in whatever order you like to perhaps give us a readout of the key points um, as you see them in relation to our response, the Scotland's response for children and families, and then um, heads up about forthcoming things that you want to pay attention to over the next few um, days and weeks in relation to how we can offer support. I don't mind Kicking off, Jackie, and uh, so obviously things have changed very much in the last 10 days. Uh, most of the ongoing activity around services for children have been put on pause. Uh, the only activity that's really continuing is around areas like redress, the care review, and some work around UNCRC. Over the last couple of weeks, we've tried to be try to make sense of what's going on uh, and work with partners to try and put helpful arrangements in place. So work very closely with COSLA, with Social Work Scotland, um, endeavour to work with the third sector, but it, it's really good today to get this connection uh, because we are concerned about 
the link into the third sector, not just nationally, but also locally. Obviously, uh, that dialogue has led to uh, new legislation, so the emergency legislation, and it is likely we will be asking ministers to turn on some of that legislation quite quickly uh, so that we can get services to children promptly, and that will mean some changes to processes, and there will be further advice coming out about that very soon. Uh, but also to provide guidance in a range of areas where people were looking for clarity. The approach has been to understand that current systems couldn't uh, continue, that we need, need some streamlining, we needed to reduce bureaucracy, we also needed to give people permission for some additional flexibility. Uh, so a range of guidance, some of it about practice like the supplementary child protection guidance, some about how the public health guidance might be applied in social work, in social care, and in broader children's services. Obviously, there's been a lot of concern about vulnerable children. By vulnerable, perhaps as a starting point, we might look at around 45,000 children in Scotland that currently have multi-agency plans. One of the early initiatives was to try and sustain education and care provision for those children through the new hub arrangement. To date, we have less than 1% of that number of 45,000 children attending those hubs. So we are looking at how that might be increased uh, and it's fair to say that in the first week that was slow to get started and it still can be increased uh, but there's an increasing realization I think that we need to look at broader strategies. Uh, so we are talking and, and I have to say that it's, it's very similar in the four nations of the United Kingdom. We've spent some time talking to colleagues in England Wales and Northern Ireland about this. So we are looking at a broader plan about how we ensure that all vulnerable children are supported, but also that children who might not previously have been perceived as vulnerable might now be becoming such, either because income isn't coming into the household or they might have been, the family might have been coping with levels of disability, uh, communication disorder, mental health issues, but aren't currently coping for one reason or another. So working quite hard at that and uh, there's daily dialogue with, with ministers about that. So a lot is changing as part of that concern for vulnerable children. Uh, I think we have been concerned about uh, the challenge for the third sector. Uh, some reports about local third sector services not being viable anymore and it would be good to, to talk about that today and probably in terms of being succinct that's an early introduction. Um, thanks, but I, I, that I think covers everything from um, uh, from my perspective too. I, I guess the only quick point would be just to clarify. Um, uh, obviously, there's a lot of changes in staff and roles at the Scottish government. From from my perspective, just to um, with specific reference to what we're doing in relation to the third sector, um, we have got a communication ready to go out, um, which is trying to um, start to open up those lines of communication um, with organisations around how things are looking on the ground, both in terms of what organisations are seeing of how, how COVID is impacting on families and communities that they're serving, um, but also how it's impacting on organisation delivery um, and, and what the responses are. Now, the first stage of that really is a kind of information sharing and kind of collect, collection of, of um, a picture and building a bit of a picture so that we can look at that from a strategic perspective. But that would then obviously feed into us um, hopefully working with, with the third sector to identify what those gaps are in provision, identify how we can um, improve the picture for delivery going forward and really understand what some of the thematic issues are coming out. So it really would be the, the kind of start of a process um, using our parent club site particularly as our one-stop shop for, for information from an SG perspective. And our marketing colleagues have developed a, a toolkit which should hopefully simplify some of that. Um, that we'll provide a link for in that letter um, and also provide a bit of uh, uh, reinforcing the message of financial support will be available to the third sector that has is already in the public domain but just kind of putting that all down in there so that organisations who maybe haven't seen it yet are, are able to kind of get that full picture of what, what support is available from a government perspective. Thanks very much. So there's a lot in there. Can I... Um ask you um, contributors firstly can we focus on um, around the impact on children I, I'm sure we all collectively 
need to process that pretty horrific figure from stat statistic that as the that less than one percent of our vulnerable <laughs> children have actually accessed services that we know of in the last week so i know that several of you if not all of you have specific ideas about how we can address that and um, I've received a few, so if I can start off with those people who've submitted some thoughts to us. Um, um, firstly, around services. Um, then I want to, to bring on sort of points around children in poverty, make a few points. And then um, once we've, and, and also around children with additional support needs, then once we've, once we've then had people's contributions around those gaps and ideas about how we can bridge some of that, um, those, those, those needs, then I'd like to um, turn to just a few points around the um, legislation. And firstly, brief, please, um, points um, to support our collective efforts around getting um, support to children. First, around early learning childcare, please. As brief background and context, we've been working really closely with colleagues in the Scottish Government to keep childminding open as long as possible. The reason's twofold, to support childcare for both key workers and also vulnerable children. Until last Wednesday, all childminding settings remained open on public health advice as the risk of transmission was deemed lower due to the small numbers. That changed last week. The guidance has been tightened. Um, the only settings that are remaining open are those supporting key workers and vulnerable children. And that's restricted to a maximum of two families per childminder at a time. We undertook a snapshot survey at the end of last week, and we're aware that there are at least 930 childminding settings still open, possibly more, a number of which have capacity within, both for key worker support and vulnerable children. What we also did is because existence guidance is based on those who are currently delivering, we asked childminders if they were to be asked to take on more vulnerable children or key workers, would they be able to do so? And an additional 500 childminders expressed interest. So there's further potential capacity there. As additional context, and I'll keep this short, um, for a number of years, we've provided community childminding services contracted by local authorities in different parts of Scotland. These support vulnerable children and their families who are one step away from traditionally what might be thought of as crisis. Um, the experience that we've had, I think it's been borne out by the data we've heard today, is that we're probably further ahead with key worker support than we are with vulnerable children. And we were a little bit concerned that things are starting to get disconnected because our main point of contact on key workers is with early years, Scottish government, local authorities. And I think with vulnerable children, it's much more education and social work. When we look at the referral path to our services, about 70 or 80% of referrals come from health. So from our point of view, there's a risk that our services may not be on the radar for social work and potential capacity for um, helping with vulnerable children. That's really as much as I wanted to say. That's, that's really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, Okay, great, obviously, and others then, earlier Scotland did um, make a plea to ensure that we are um, bearing in mind the capacity of um, appropriate early years settings as well, and a sense uh, that we're possibly not connecting in with wider children's services via social work and health around the early years um, opportunities. So I think that's, that's a really important cohort of children and families that we don't want to lose sight of. Other examples there that, that people want to contribute to to support government efforts to begin to sort of tie up and coordinate? We've heard that families with vulnerable children are not wanting to send them to the school care. And my guess one reason is the stigma of being labelled a vulnerable family and then sending them in there. And another reason might be protecting families and there might be a multiple of reasons that I think that needs to be looked at because assuming that every vulnerable family wants to self-identify as vulnerable during these times is an interesting concept. So I think a really important point there, isn't it, about, um, about the labelling um, and obviously the, I understand that the initial response from government might have been that we need to try and um, corral the need given how overwhelming it could be but perhaps inadvertently we've sent out some pretty unfortunate messages. I think there are some parallels to the 
treatment of so-called then vulnerable two-year-olds as well, where we saw parents voting with their um, yeah, voting with their feet in terms of determined not to stigmatise their families and, and their own needs. Is that something that government could think about in terms of the messaging as we move forward? We also um, need to understand that there are a range of reasons why um, the provision that is, is being taken up at such a low level and it might not get much higher. Um, it provides continuity for many children and young people but actually we need to look at a range of ways that we can support all of those vulnerable children. Uh, for a minority, it will be in the new hubs. Uh, and it is helpful to know where there is capacity because in some parts of the, the country, the current hubs don't have any more capacity, so we can pass that on. But actually what keeping the schools open for vulnerable children was meant to do was exactly that. Um, in itself, that's not the response that's gonna be uh, effective for the vast majority of those 45,000 children. We do need to look at different responses. Now clearly children on the Child Protection Register are still supported uh, by social workers, other children are still supported in different ways, but across the whole range we need to look at a number of arrangements whereby we can support the great bulk because it's only ever going to be a minority probably uh, that we'll look for in schools. I think in England where it's also similarly low they have an aspiration to get up to 10 percent but that's still looking at 90 percent being supported in different ways one of the things that we've we've done with the nabrlauer and all of our services remain operational albeit some of them have been paired back in the manner in which we're supporting families has changed so for our family support services we are using technology a lot more than we would have normally done but we are um, maintaining contact with the children and families that that we're aware of but the other thing that we've done importantly locally is that we've kind of instructed to our teams locally, you need to link in through the local resilience planning uh, mechanisms, because we need to be part of that collective effort actually to identify and support the kids in the community that we need it the most. So our staff are, I mean, a lot of the role has changed because it is actually emergency, emergency and crisis support that they're out delivering alongside local authority staff. And we're also, obviously promoting the getting money to families as quickly as we possibly can element of it. Um, we've seen in terms of the money that's gone out of the organisation over a thousand percent increase in the number of families coming to us um, looking for financial assistance. So we've um, the urgent assistance fund that we provide has gone from 50 grand, we're now sitting somewhere in the region of 270,000 pounds that we've got available to us but that will run out very quickly. So again, we're working with local authorities around how we can actually best support families that are in, in dire need. But I would make a plea to the sector to not create different networks, but to plug into the ones that local authorities are already providing. Can I throw in something there? So um, I suppose two things. One is I just want to plea to whatever the government can do to help sort out the identification of who are key workers, um, because we have some of our um, uh, domestic abuse staff who are going out to, to try and admit women to refuges and things like that who are being stopped by the police. And what is even a more widespread, pro and also we've heard similar stories from Rape Crisis Scotland, uh, but we've also, on a wide, more widespread basis, we're, we're really concerned that our, that our teams and our staff really need places for children in schools so that they can work, but also the children experiencing domestic abuse are often not listed on those lists of known to services, um, vulnerable children, and, and school is the only safe place for them. So uh, we, we really are asking if you could help us work through how we could identify those children without doing that whole stigmatizing thing. And also just to say what we're hearing from, from women and children is that, you know, they are still trying to figure out how to get loop paper and um, put food on the table. So I think there's going to be a while before they start looking out with their homes. And so some of, some of what we're seeing, we shouldn't be, be thinking this is the way it's going to be. And finally, for our, for our services and families in remote and island communities, over the longer term, what probably is going to do more 
provide more help of connecting isolated children um, with other children and with um, community supports will be reliable broadband. And I can't tell you that how frustrating it is that we have services ready to provide services and women having to go and stand on a hill and wave their phone about. So, you know, if there's anything the government could do to speed up um, access, digital access in rural and remote areas, I think three months down the line, that's going to be the thing that made the most difference. I suppose I had a specific question about families who are um, at home and unable to leave at the moment. So a number of the families we support are very worried about leaving the house or physically can't leave the house, but are finding it very difficult to uh, be regarded as priority um, for shopping deliveries or other deliveries into their house. Is the Scottish Government working on some guidance with retailers around the prioritisation of home delivery for food for those people who can afford to shop and to have it delivered. There's discussion with supermarkets going on, don't know about home delivery in particular. In relation to broadband access, both in terms of, of children and families being very isolated, but also exacerbating the problem of the attainment gap, because there are lots of children who are not able to access the online classrooms and, and the stuff that's been put out online to support families during the crisis. And, and I, I think there may be, um, I sort of heard something, somebody at the Scottish Government w was, was quite keen to champion it, but I haven't really heard very much about it. But it would seem to me that there needs to be a really, a really big um, push to identify what the need is and, and to address it both in terms of providing equipment for people to actually access online services and, and ideas and support, but also um, Wi-Fi. Yeah, I think we all appreciate the broadband point now. Um, yeah. I certainly <laughs> I certainly appreciate it here looking out over the Murray Firth with no mobile signal at all and a phone bill that's going up day by day. Mm -hmm. um, just a couple of things. Firstly, on key workers, it is local authorities that are working this out. We've been very clear that all social care staff are key workers and the Cabinet Secretary and Scottish Government put out a number of messages to local authorities. Our understanding is that is now settling down. Uh, the reports we're getting is that that's less and less of an issue but if others are still experiencing issues about that and it might be because of particular groups of staff let us know and we can we can try and get that message out a question for the forum i think is we're trying to look at how we might put together data on how children are being supported and would something like a weekly report from the significant organizations very briefly talking about how many children they're supporting and where is that sort of thing viable, is the question. We'll do talk to the forum, the forum's partners, and we'll get back to you very quickly. Okay, so um, if I could to highlight some key activity on child poverty, please. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, big concern. One in four of Scotland's children are already living in poverty before this crisis. Uh, families being hit by additional income shock as a result of the crisis, and the risk of more children being pushed into poverty as a result. We've been particularly um, pleased to see the additional investment in the Scottish Welfare Fund and the commitment yesterday from Scottish Government to continue to prioritise the Scottish child payment. But uh, the reality is that new payment, that new additional support for families uh, won't be being rolled out until next year. So what we are keen to do is uh, engage um, with government uh, to look at potential options for bringing forward additional financial support for families immediately uh, to provide uh, the resources that families need to meet the whole range of additional needs as well as the existing needs uh, that, that children uh, are facing. So we've been drawing up uh, a list of potential mechanisms using existing mechanisms, um, existing Scottish security payments, social security payments, uh, start grants, um, looking at uh, the Scottish Welfare Fund, looking at discretionary housing payments uh, and other local authority powers to see how uh, an immediate kind of equivalent to the Scottish Child Payment could be made to low-income families uh, sooner rather than later raised here today. So as I say, we're kind of, sort of putting that together and be sharing that. Great. Highlight for us the responses to the legislation, the new COVID legislation and any other quick <laughs> issues. Certainly, um, I'd be happy to share a briefing afterwards that we wrote with some of the detail on it. But basically, we've had kind of three key issues raised by our members in relation to the UK and the Scottish legislation. 
The first is in terms of the Scottish legislation, then really welcome the fact that child rights impact assessment was done at such short notice on the legislation. Um, but there's a general feeling that it hasn't picked up particular concerns direct, um, by, by our members, particularly around the children's hearing system and some of the measures that have been put in place, which really do impact on children and young people's ability to participate and reflect also back on some of the discussion we've had already about children perhaps being unable to participate if they don't have access to broadband or to IT facilities to um, join in with the hearing. Um, another area that's been picked up is around the discrepancy between how children in Scotland are treated and children in the rest of the UK. Um, and so because of um, the kind of varied definition of the age of the child in Scots law and in the rest of the UK, um, some of the measures that have been introduced could actually end up meaning that 16 and 17 year olds are criminalised um, for not complying with um, measures. Um, this wouldn't happen in the rest of the UK where the definition of a child is under 18 rather than under 16 as it is in various areas of the UK and the um, Scottish um, coronavirus bill. Um, and then the final area that has been picked up by our members is really the disproportionate impact that um, the measures that are being taken will have on certain groups of children and young people. So reflecting back again about children in poverty, um, but also looking at the um, legislative developments that really disproportionately impact um, on children in care, children um, with disabilities and additional support needs, um, and um, young carers as well. The, the, it lessens some of the protections that are in place for young carers. And we have outlined this in the briefing, so it's just really to highlight it now, but to offer our support to government, and um, because we appreciate that this has been put together really quickly, and so to offer our support in linking in with members and raising some of their concerns, and perhaps if there's going to be an ongoing um, impact assessment of these measures, we can link some of these um, experiences of the children that our members work with in with government to inform the next steps that you're taking. Okay, thanks very much. Can I move now to, um, to take about 10 minutes around issues that have been raised with us um, around the impact on our workforce across the children's sector? Key workers, critical area of course and definition there. So obviously right up at the top is the PPE and also testing. Um, they're looking for clarity. There needs to be consistency of advice in particular for third sector. So there still is an issue with that, doing 12 different reports for different local authorities. That's a big issue um, for the workforce, both with the local authorities and with grant funders as well. Um, so with grant funders, they're getting issues of some saying, listen, you don't need to do anything, keep the money, right through to others saying, if you don't um, do the outcomes, you're not going to get the money. And uh, both of you can have a project which has actually got several funds, different funds and different attitudes. So that's putting a big demand and we're asking for consistency on that. The local authority respect, uh, retrospective payments. People are waking up in, at night about that one um, and are looking for clarity on that uh, because they're really concerned about what's going to be happening at the other side of this. Um, and what that will mean. Uh, there's some quite draconian ways of measuring that being asked for. So again, it's adding to people's workload. Also with, I think it was ILS, yeah, Independent Living Fund as well. There's a uncertainty about um, whether that's going to be honored or not if uh, people you know, uh, stop using it. And there was some issues around the police uh, and what they were, how they were sort of stopping people. So was guidance going to be given out to the police? Um, and I think it was the last one about generic emails coming out from NHS and Scottish government and the impact of those when people aren't being, it's not being checked through, first of all, with people. So that may have stopped because things have kind of, we're beginning to get more of a handle on this, I'm not sure. Thanks very much. I think we would just want to also add in Children's Scotland just um, being aware around training and um, development opportunities, uh, which sounds um, in the real world of how, how the staff are responding and how they are they able to, um, to, to manage the new world, are they getting sufficient support, what 
further training needs might they need? What about the impact on increasing the volunteer workforce and what support they're getting as well? Clearly we're in an emergency phase, but we are kind of concerned to make sure that people feel equipped and that they are getting um, as good a support and, um, and to, to be honest, safe practice as possible within the current circumstances was, was something else. Other, other contributions there around, around the workforce? Just on the point around um, testing and um, protective equipment, one of the things that had been coming through to us um, was around concerns in providing care for um, children and young people and also adults with um, complex needs and particularly a lot of anxiety coming through particularly from family carers and while not part of the, work, the, the workforce they are kind of providing a caring uh, and support role to a lot of people um, with complex needs and actually not knowing um, when they can do that and when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate to do that so and also looking at and one of the things we had put out a statement yesterday and one of the things that we had wondered around that would be if there would look to be um, priority testing for a number of um, groups who are at risk but, all, um, but including within that pe people with learning disabilities, children and young people with complex needs and also their family carers. Can we come in on just one or two of those points? So on personal protective equipment, firstly thank you to CCPS because they've been working with us along with Social Work Scotland on guidance uh, in residential care um, looking at the public health guidance and making it more appropriate uh, and that guidance will also cover a range of other community settings but in particular it focuses on residential care it's currently with health protection scotland uh, i have been hoping it would be ready this week but um, i haven't yet seen the final draft uh, ppe should be rolling out it should be accessible you need to contact your local centers with regard to that but any registered service there is a triage system whereby people should get it and although there have been problems with supply it is now being made available but there's an exercise going on today about reaffirming just who should get um, PPE it covers many of the groups that have been talked about there that does include unpaid carers um, however it does have to first target the workforce before it starts to look at the wider population and clearly in terms of the workforce there are priority groups who, who do need to get it first but that that work is going on on testing what we're being told is that's also being rolled out but clearly on the ground uh, it's not yet happening but as far as we understand the direction of travel is that increasingly testing should be available across the workforce i just wanted to come in on on a couple of points that have been made one of the challenges that we're facing is we don't do residential setting, we do field-based work and that is a huge problem because the young people and the families we work with are risk takers at best, yeah, um, don't go to school if they can help it and therefore it's how we, how we engage with them out in the community and we're finding every single local authority has a completely different expectation of how we will support young people in those authorities. Um, so it's an interesting one when you talk about PPE. So one of our authorities comes to us and says, we'd like you to take PPE, PPE. We won't train you how to wear it. We won't show you how to use it. And you're going to go out into a field-based setting with PPE that you've never worked with before. What are you going to do? And then the next local authority says, absolutely wouldn't expect you to do that. We'd expect you to contact your young people through the internet or through the phone, et cetera. So I suppose frustration for me is that it is absolutely conflicting information we're getting. Second frustration takes into, in some areas we're a key worker, in other areas we're not a key worker, and that's still going on. Uh, third area, I absolutely understand the triaging of PPE, but it is coming through as a confused message on how you triage PPE in the first area. Then probably the, the, the fourth one in terms of how then do we support uh, people. You know, we work on risk-based assessments of the young people we're working with, but that in, in this current environment with what you hear um, in terms of how far apart, you know, an interesting point, how do we do a field-based support for a young person who needs some care and we have to keep three metres or two metres or eight metres away from that young person and have a really in-depth personal support and conversation with them? It, it's, it is utterly conflicted everywhere we speak at the moment. And so I go back to the first point. And if you start asking us to write reports and you want to get data, 
you need to talk to the 32 local authorities you need to talk to the regulator and agree one report for us because otherwise it's just going to be craziness okay i know it's incredibly frustrating um to be asked to do this so many different ways um i i, sh I share your pain um having things fed back to me in so many different ways and not able to get a clear national picture um, of things we will certainly do our best to stress to people that if they are using the same organization we should be asking the same questions i think there's a great desire from us to try and ensure that there is consistency coming through to you and in every other context as well that the that the 32 are operating as close as possible as one organization now um, in this in this time okay thank you very much uh, last comment then if that's okay before we move on to the next um if we're clear about the purpose of data, it's something that helps us all collectively and it's not onerous, then that's fine. But I will resist really strongly any call for data that takes frontline attention away from where it needs to be. Right. That leads us in quite nicely. I'm very quickly going to sum up some of the issues that have already come up um, in addition to the reporting. And I think the key, the key issue is that um, government have attended this meeting and obviously there are lots of other meetings going on, but the extent to which we can make sure that there's a really dynamic, proactive response so that we are genuinely partners as we move forward and out of this immediate emergency phase into actually getting things even better and more efficient, I think is our plea collectively. And I think the forum and the representatives on the forum want to know how best we could do that. There's also a range of issues around the funding and stability, um, but others have um, raised that significant concerns around um, the funding and stability, given we are expected to be responding as equal partners. So um, who would like to sum up some of the concerns around the, the funding? Just for context, um, about 20% of our funding comes from core funding to the Scottish Government. Um, we've been waiting for confirmation for funding from the Families and Communities Fund for this year, and it has been delayed again. As an organisation, we face many challenges in childminding in relation to workforce, other areas. We're also trying to support the national response to coronavirus and have a significant role both in that and in supporting ELC as part of our recovery. The concern I think I and others have at this stage is that at the moment funding appears to be continuing to be extended on a short term three monthly basis at a time when we desperately need stability and a longer term approach to launch a platform to enable us to support recovery. Um, many organisations, I think including yourself, also have operational decisions and commitments beyond the next three or six months that we're having to look at. And I'm just quite concerned at the moment. Um, we accept we're in a very different place now with coronavirus, but we are concerned by the short term approach at the moment. And I think one of the risks is that we could potentially get into the territory of unintended consequences and risk of destabilising a sector at this time. For added context, I mean, the Scottish Government has, I mean, we very much welcome, I think they've um, supported the sector, or not sector, but they've provided more than £600 million to support coronavirus. This includes the Third Sector Resilience Fund for short-term cash flow. But in context, the Families and Communities Fund is only £16 million per year, which is quite a small sum. Um, and we continue to press the Scottish Government for confirmation of funding. I recognise it's difficult for the Scottish Government to do that at this time, but I think we also received an email from CORA yesterday confirming that Organisations in Scotland who receive funding from the Scottish Government will not be eligible to apply to the UK's job retention scheme to put staff on furlough. That puts potentially further pressure on us. And I was really just keen to get a sense from other leaders across the sector as to how they feel about this and if they share the need for some stability at this time to support recovery. Thanks very much. Just to add, obviously we're also at the forum concerned with those organisations, particularly at a local level, who are equally on precarious funding arrangements. Um, and we'd like more information on that and what local partnerships are, are able to do and access to some of these funds as well. And how we can support access to those funds is, is, is a key concern for us, I think, at the moment. Who'd like to 
give some response and also some indication of what we could do because we will be proposing I think as a forum to come back in more detail and in writing as a forum about about these issues but your immediate response would be very helpful. So I can pick that up. I, um, I think we're always going to be stuck a little bit between a rock and a hard place with, with, the, with the fact fund decisions because um, the, the reasons that Minister decided to delay the decisions a little bit more was to pro help provide a little bit more stability to the sector in terms of the organisations that were currently funded through the CYPIEF fund and ALEC fund. But appreciating the point that there were going to be organisations that that was more destabilising than others with, with that decision. And as I say, it's stuck a little bit between a rock and a hard place. I think what I appreciate the point about a kind of the three monthly extension potentially being more um, of, of an issue. And I think I would be interested to know when, when you talk about um, the, the request for stability, what kind of things specifically now we've, we've had that decision in the current context, what you would be looking for us to do that could help specifically and practically um, and we would be very very open to kind of thinking about those things um, going forward. Further meetings would be very helpful uh, because we do need open communication <clears throat> but also absolutely appreciate the point about we need more consistency and less hassle um, and that is what we're trying to achieve just now. Yeah and I would just echo that and add that you know very happy to look at um, issues if you if you're um, and, and intend to sort of gather these and send them to us you know very happy to look at that and see see what we can we can do to um, to address them. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, my point was in relation to funding, and I appreciate that the Families and Communities Fund is one part of that, but I actually think there's something at play here that's much more fundamental, and that is the fact that whereas we are trying to continue, and many other organisations will be continuing to, to provide services, I would be the last person to say that that's on a business as usual footing because it's not. But what I think we need to be clear about, we've had um, letters of support and comfort for some local authorities saying, you know, don't worry about your funding. But actually, we still don't have a cl really clear, coherent response to the third sector from government offering protection for existing arrangements to continue and funding in the midst of this remarkable time. We have it for local government, we have it for Scottish government. In fact, there's more funding coming. So what I'm saying is that for the third sector, can we be afforded the respect of local government and central government saying to us, we recognise that you're an equal and respected partner, you will be impacted by this pandemic, and for the next three to six months, your funding will not be affected, even if you cannot deliver your whole service. Can I just say, uh, like many of you, I suspect we get funds from different parts of the Scottish government. And the Equality Unit extended our funding nine months, which, you know, we, we would prefer three years, you know, but the reality is that was a whole lot more reassuring than three months, which is not at all reassuring. So I think that there's the short term and the longer term. The longer term is sort out contracts, but the shorter term is make make it an extension that's reasonably helpful rather than one we none of us even know if we'll be out of lockdown in three months so other other parts of government have managed to do it so i would strongly suggest that the children and young people's fund be uh, considering the same thing i can completely hear that point and we will we will take that one back absolutely to share a couple of years ago i ran a ferry company we had a bit of a problem with government and funding and I went to see them and said, can you extend our contract? And they said, yeah, how many years would you like it? And so it was extended for three years. And, and the, the, the forum will know, I've said this a few times, why is it that we can do large transport contracts in years? And what we're talking about today, three to six months, really, it's just nonsense. We need to start talking in years. And that should be the currency. And, and I can't see if others wanting to come in. No, okay. No, it was just to briefly respond in terms of what we'd find would be useful for stability. It's getting back to the principle that if we want to start to plan recovery now from where we are with coronavirus and a much wider impact, that's not three months. You know, you're talking this could be planning over a few years. We need the longer term stability of confirmation of funding to be able to do that work substantively and seriously. Um, on a three month basis, it's just not going to happen. So I don't want that to sound negative, it's just the realism that we do need longer term stability to be able to undertake strategic work to help us recover. 
Thank you. I, I, I do take that point and I'm conscious of, of all of your time, but if, there, if, if there's anything additional to the, the three month point as well um, that would, would help too, then I'm happy to take those points offline with people. So am I right in thinking there's no other um, comments that people have to raise at this moment with the Scottish Government? Just to say that um, I think we're very aware regarding funding that um, a lot of chief executives are feeling really overwhelmed just now with is there 10 funds out at the moment and trying to grapple with that and their staffing and their services and it does feel that there's no easy route into actually understanding what some of these funds are for and who it's intended for and the clarification yesterday from Cora about furlough actually made things it was clear but I think it's made a lot of people have to rethink what they're doing and um, so we are trying to conduct a survey in the play sector to try and see what the impact is at the moment but our worry is that a lot of services are shutting down and they've no idea under what circumstances they might be able to reopen. So maybe the conversation is too early now at this stage, but it is, there seems to be a lot of money thrown at the problem, but very little discernment as to how it actually is going to work. Okay. And can I just make a follow-up question about the, the furloughing email as well, just because I've heard of different interpretations of that email from Cora about what it means for recipients of the fund. Um, and whether it is um, a proportion of, because uh, for a lot of people, it, it, the, the fund only covers up a portion of their overall income, and whether that means that um, it, it, you know, that there will be opportunities to furlough if you're just getting a certain proportion of your income from that fund. Just to say on that, I mean, it doesn't particularly affect us, and particularly the core bit, but uh, on furlough. But a COSFO is having a meeting on exactly that, on furlough, and how it's affecting people with somebody from Scottish Government. Thank you. Yeah, our understanding is, my understanding is that um, if it is only a proportion of your costs that are paid by public funding, and you do have other funding routes that pay for staff costs, then it could be that those those members of staff could be furloughed and, and um, apply for the UK government scheme um, with no issues. So it, there is a bit of a kind of case by case basis depending on um, the terms and conditions of the, the grant um, that, that's going to each individual organisation. Um, but we would, um, you know, we, we would obviously be hoping that as much flexibility as possible could be applied um, for, for each organisation and be supportive of that, but within the terms of the UK scheme. But I think there is a little bit of scope for um, splitting some of the, um, the ways that, that we can apply for the scheme. Thanks very much. You've heard loud and clear how much work is being done, how much commitment there is, um, and that will all continue. But it's, it is really a great shame that, the, um, that some of these barriers around our long terms, longer term stability and funding, how they are getting in the way. And then in supplementary, equally, this sort of multiple data requests and recording, etc. So if we can continue to work together um, with you around how we can remove as many of those barriers as possible, so we can all get on with delivering um, as, as well as possible for children and moving on to filling some of these gaps. I think that's, that, that's what I'm hearing anyway. Perhaps we can come back to you then in terms of um, next steps um, and engaging with you more widely. That'd be really good. Yeah, very much yeah. welcome. Very much welcome. Okay, folks. Thank you for listening to the Children in Scotland podcast. To find out more about any of our work, or about joining us in membership, head to our website at www.childreninscotland.org.uk.